the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Elephant in the Dark by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. I have been asked by a great Western Orientalist, who has also asked me not to name him, that as I should be dealing with dialogue between Christians and Muslims, he feels that it is incumbent upon me to denounce, as he puts it, the scorn which some Muslim scholars have from time to time directed towards European and American Orientalists and other specialists. He also writes that I should make it plain that, in his estimation, one cannot speak of, or for, Muslims as a whole, since they are grouped into two main sections, the Sunni and the Shia, and that therefore he believes there can be no dialogue between Muslims as such and Christians as such, and that Sufis, mystics of Islam, though surrendering to God, are in fact anti-Muslim. I beg your indulgence to deal with these points. Ordinarily one would not have given them much prominence, but after contacting a number of Christian scholars who have made Islam their study, I have discovered from their reactions that they too feel that this is a fit subject for emphasis. When the Prophet Muhammad was asked to curse unbelievers, he replied, according to authoritative tradition, I was not sent for this, nor was I sent but as a mercy to mankind. He further said, It is unworthy to injure people's reputations, and it is unworthy to curse anyone, and it is unworthy to abuse anyone, and it is unworthy for the faithful to talk vainly. As to the matter of whether we speak as Muslims, in spite of what has been called the difference between Shias and Sunnis, I do not myself believe that it is necessary to attempt to compose answers when this has already been sufficiently well done. The Muslims follow the precept laid down by Muhammad when he said, Muslims are like one wall, some parts strengthening others, in such a way they must support each other. Following the reasoning that something which has been well and adequately said should be repeated rather than an attempt made to supplant it, I am fortunate to be able to quote from a recent comment upon this subject by a great scholar of Islam in Persia, Syed Hussain Nassar, who is Professor of the History of Science and Philosophy in Tehran, and comes from an honoured family. In a book recently published in the West, he says, In fact, Sunniism and Shiism, belonging both to the total orthodoxy of Islam, do not in any way destroy its unity. The unity of a tradition is not destroyed by different applications of it, but by the destruction of its principles and forms as well as its continuity. Being the religion of unity, Islam in fact displays more homogeneity and less religious diversity than other worldwide religions. Nasser Sayyid Hussein, Ideals and Realities of Islam, London, George Allen and Unwin, 1966, 1971 Impression. Within the submission system of Islam, as in Christianity, there is room for a tremendous variety of opinion once the basic beliefs are accepted. The basis of Islam is submission to God, but there have been, indeed still are, Muslims who accept the Qur'an as the law and not the traditions, the sayings of the Prophet. There are even those who call the Sharia, commonly accepted as the holy way of law, or Islam in its extrapolation from the Qur'an, an innovation. The basic commandment is so basic that this diversity in unity is possible. Muslim thinkers themselves sometimes express surprise when they come across varieties of this phenomenon though they seldom fail to integrate examples into their thought when time has done its work. And this has always been the way in Islam. 
As for the misconception of Sufis as mad dervishes, opportunists and mountebanks, or mysterious at best, degenerate at worst, undermining Islam, faith and social stability, cultists of doubtful habits and exploiting tendencies, imitators of saints, this is by no means confined to the West. But since the explanation is simple, that there are rotten apples possible in any barrel, and Sufis' utterances are not always understood without context, and plenty of people have helped to write the record down the centuries, what is needed is only information on a wide scale and understanding, and only those lacking one or more of these really remain opposed. The outlook for Sufi knowledge and appreciation of the past, present and future Sufi contribution is bright indeed. Professor Nasser has illuminated many important aspects of this picture for Western scholars, and he may have been hard done by through the publication of criticisms of his work which alleges emotional bias and anti-Western subjectivity. He has, in fact, generously acknowledged much Western work of Sufism, Shiism, comparative religion, and various ways of looking at metaphysics. In, for instance, Sufi essays, London, George Allen and Unwin, 1972, he covers many interesting points, deplores the activities of superficialists and imitators, discusses the Shia and Sunni attitudes, and cites recent Western work which has attempted to convey Sufi thought in Western modes. It should, however, be remembered that the sort of opposition which a scholar encounters today is rarely anything like what our next writer, the great mystic Al-Ghazali, had to face. With his work thrown into the flames in Spain by his co-religionists, who later acclaimed him as the proof of Islam. Looking at the 500 entries in a bibliography of references to my own books, now in preparation, we find that, including the usual personal attacks and ideological vilification, less than 4% are hostile from all countries, and some of those at least seem clearly based upon misunderstandings. We have seen how well Christians and Muslims have thought alike and worked together, how they have respected one another's spirituality and service, and how each has appreciated the concept of surrender which is inherent in the tradition which links them. Before going further into the sociology, psychology or history of the two religions, I want to tell you something of a typical Muslim approach. Here are the words of one of our greatest mystics, Al-Ghazali, 1058-1111, whose works were so esteemed in the Middle Ages of Christendom that clerics are on records in the West as holding the belief that he was in fact a Christian writer, sound in doctrine. Whereas Ghazali was, of course, not only an experiential Sufi mystic, but a former professor of Islamic theology of the Nizamiya at Baghdad. In the passages here selected from the Minhaj al-Abidin, The Way of the Worshippers, or High Road of the Submitted, he describes experiences and the disciplines which accompany the seeker in his efforts to worship and to fulfill the will of God. First, we may briefly note a Christian scholar's view of him. Another writer whose work had great influence on the West was Al-Ghazal, Abu Hamid ibn Muhammad al-Tuzi al-Ghazali, 1058-1111. Surnamed Ujatu al-Islam, Islam's convincing proof, his varied life was lived amid the significant intellectual and religious movements of his day. In turn, he had been philosopher, scholastic, traditionist, skeptic and mystic, a man of unquestionable sincerity and firm moral purpose, one of the comparatively few men of his race who consistently exerted himself to awake in his co-religionists a zeal for morality. He has retained in Islam a position somewhat comparable with that of St. Thomas Aquinas in Christianity. In reading his theological treatises, one remembers only with an effort that the author is a Mohammedan. Professor Alfred Guillaume, Philosophy and Theology, 
in Legacy of Islam, Oxford 1968 printing. This is the passage describing the Seven Valleys, written in the 11th century and considered a textbook of mystical teaching, derived from Ghazali's own experience. The Seven Valleys Know, my brethren, that worship is the fruit of knowledge, the benefit of life and the capital of virtues. It is the aim and object of men of noble aspirations to have keen inward sight. It is their summum bonum and their everlasting paradise. I am your creator, says the Quran. Worship me. You will have your recompense and your efforts will be rewarded. Worship, then, is essential for man but is beset with difficulties and hardships. It has stumbling blocks and pitfalls in its tortuous path which is haunted by cutthroats and goblins, while helpers are scarce and friends are few. But this path of worship must be dangerous, for, says the prophet, Paradise is surrounded by sufferings and covered by tribulations, while hell abounds in ease and free enjoyment of passions. Poor man, he is weak, his engagements are heavy, times are hard and life is short. But journey from here to hereafter being unavoidable, if he neglects taking necessary provisions, he is sure to perish. Ponder over the gravity of the situation and the seriousness of our condition. By Allah our lot is pitiable indeed, for many are called but few are chosen. When I found the path of worship so difficult and dangerous, I composed certain works, chiefly Ihya Ulumidin, in which I pointed out the ways and means of surmounting those difficulties, facing the dangers boldly and crossing the path with success. But certain persons looking to the outward expressions of my work failed to understand the meaning and purpose of it, and not only rejected the book, but treated it in a manner unbecoming of a Muslim. Footnote during the lifetime of the author, the book was publicly burnt in the market by the ulama of Spain, the land of the Inquisition. But I was not disheartened, for there were persons who used to ridicule the Holy Quran, calling it the stories of the ancients. Nor was I offended, for I felt pity on them, for they knew not what they were doing to themselves. I hate disputations now, but I must do something for them. So out of compassion for my brethren, I prayed to God to enlighten me on the subject in a new manner. Listen then, that the first requisite which awakens man from the lethargy of forgetfulness and turns him towards the path, is God's grace, which stirs the mind to meditate thus. I am the recipient of so many gifts, life, power, reason, speech, and I find myself mysteriously protected from many troubles and evils. Who is my benefactor? Who is my saviour? I must be grateful to him in a fitting manner, otherwise the gifts will be taken away and I shall be undone. These gifts reveal their purpose like tools in the hands of an artisan and the world appears to me like a beautiful picture leading my thoughts towards the painter. 1. The Valley of Knowledge The soliloquy takes him to the valley of knowledge where implicit faith in the divine messenger leads the way and tells him, The benefactor is that one being who has no associate with him. He is thy creator who is omnipresent, though unseen whose commandments must be obeyed both inwardly and outwardly. He has so ordained that the good shall be rewarded and the wicked punished. The choice is now thine, for thou art held responsible for thy actions. Acquire knowledge under God-fearing ulama, learned men, with a conviction that knows no wavering. When the valley of knowledge is crossed, man prepares for worship, but his guilty conscience upbraids him, saying, Canst thou knock at the door of thy sanctuary? Away with thy pollutious abominations. 2. The Valley of Repentance 
The poor sinner falls down in the valley of repentance when a voice is heard, Repent, repent, for thy Lord is forgiving. He now takes heart, and rising with joy proceeds further. 3. The Valley of Stumbling Blocks And he enters into a valley full of stumbling blocks, chief of which are four in number, viz. the tempting world, the attracting people, the old enemy Satan, and the inordinate self. Let him have four counterforces so as to tide over the difficulty. Try to choose retired life. Avoid mixing with all sorts of people. Fight out the old enemy and control thyself by the bridle of piety. Let it be remembered that the fourfold counterforces have to face four other psychological troubles, viz. 1. Anxious care about man's daily bread as a result of his retirement. 2. Doubts and anxieties about his private affairs disturbing peace of his mind. 3. Worries, hardships and indignities for want of social contact. For when man wishes to serve his God, Satan attacks him openly and secretly from all sides. 4. Unpleasant happenings and unexpected sufferings as the outcome of his destiny. 4. The Valley of Tribulations These psychological troubles throw the poor worshipper into the Valley of Tribulations. In this plight let man protect himself by 1. Dependence on God in the matter of his sustenance. 2. Invocation of his help when he finds himself helpless. 3. Patience in sufferings. 4. Joyous submission to his will. Five, The Thundering Valley Crossing this fearful valley of tribulations, man thinks that the passage will not be easy but to his amazement he finds that service is uninteresting, prayers are mechanical and contemplation has no pleasure. He is indolent, melancholy and stupid. Puzzled and perplexed, he now enters into the thundering valley. The lightning flash of hope dazzles his sight, and he falls down trembling when he hears the deafening sound of the thunder of fear. His eyes brimming with tears imitate the clouds, and his pure thoughts flash with the lightning. In a moment the mystery of human responsibility with its reward for good actions and punishment for wicked deeds was solved. Henceforth his worship will not be lip service, and his daily work will not be a drudgery. Soaring on high, he will ply on the wings of hope and fear. Six. The Abysmal Valley With a light heart, in a happy mood, he was now proceeding further when suddenly the Abysmal Valley presents its dreadful sight. Looking deep into the nature of his actions, he found that those who were good were either actuated by the desire of winning the approbation of his fellow men, or were simply the outcome of vainglory. On one side he saw the hydra-headed monster of hypocrisy lurking, and on the other side the bewitching Pandora of conceit with her box open. In despair he knew not what to do when, lo, the angel of sincerity emerged from the depth of his heart, and taking him by the arm, carried him through the valley. Expressing his gratitude for the divine favour, he was proceeding further, when the thought of multifarious favours for his unworthy self and his incapacity to do full justice to his thanksgivings overwhelmed him. 7. The Valley of Hymns This was the Valley of Hymns where, mortal as he was, he tried his best to sing the songs of praise to the immortal being. The invisible hand of divine mercy then opened the door of the garden of love. He was ushered in with body and soul, for both had played their part directly and indirectly. 
here ends the journey. The worshipper is now living among his fellow men like a traveller, but his heart lives in him waiting to carry out the last order. O soul, thou art at peace. Return to thy Creator well-pleased, well-pleasing. Then enter among my servants, and enter into my paradise. Quran, chapter 89, Al-Fajr. See also Ali Syed Nawab, Some Moral and Religious Teachings of Al-Ghazali, Baroda 1920 and Lahore, Ashraf 1960, 3rd edition. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idrishah Foundation.